This is episode 82 of Ethics and Culture Cast from the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture. Welcome to episode 82 of Ethics and Culture Cast from Notre Dame's DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture. I'm Ken Hellenius, the communications specialist at the center. In this episode, we welcome Canadian musical superstars Natalie McMaster and Danelle Leahy to the studio. They were at Notre Dame to play a fantastic show as part of the presenting series at the DeBartolo Performing Arts Center in a concert co-sponsored by the DeNicola Center. Let's sit down together for this wonderful conversation. Well, Natalie and Danelle, thank you so much for taking time to come and be with us here. You're welcome. You're welcome. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you each from? How did you get started in music? Kind of those sorts of things. Well, you've got two different answers coming because we're from two different provinces. Okay. Danelle's from Ontario. I'm from Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. And uh, I came from a, a home there that was very rich in the local traditions um, that would be the step dance style, the fiddle style, piano accompaniment, the Gaelic language, um, even the sense of humor. I, I group into all that. And uh, my my parents were very musical. They both came from musical homes. Mom was a great step dancer. She taught a lot of people, um, you know, back in the 70s, I guess, how to step dance, including myself. She taught me when I was about five. And then my dad started me on the fiddle when I was, you know, nine and a half or so. And he doesn't play fiddle, but he is the brother of Buddy McMaster, who's probably the most famous Cape Breton fiddler ever. And, and yeah, I just grew up in that, you know, musical home. We went to all the different functions. Local communities would host different events featuring the local entertainment. And, and the square dancing was popular too, still is. Went to a lot of those types of events, and yeah, that's that's a little bit about where I came from. Danelle, take it away. I am a farm boy from Ontario. I uh, grew up on a beef farm. My mother is from Cape Breton. Okay. And a uh, wonderful story how mom, mom and dad met, but anyway, they met, and, and I'm one of 11, the oldest boy. Um, and we played, mom and dad had a band the whole time we were growing up. They played kind of round dance music, and played for weddings and square dances and things. And so uh, they taught me to play, all of us to play when we were young. I started playing when I was three. And um, we farmed, went to church, played music, went to school the odd time, and uh, just kind of uh, found ourselves playing more music. And eventually mom and dad um, stayed home on the farm or we traveled around and, and played as, as siblings. And then um, I think that uh, is that sums it up. Beef farm, uh, which still is active today. My brothers and I still, and our wives and children, run the uh, beef operation. Wow. Okay. So you've got this active life, both as musicians. You each have recording careers. You have a recording career together. What does family life look like? What What's an average day in the McMaster Leahy family look like? Janelle and I got married 21 years ago, and our oldest daughter is 18, and our youngest is five. And so we have seven children and uh, five girls and two boys. And our daily family life has definitely changed through the years, sort of dramatically. I think we had at one point the, the tightest knit age group was we had five under age, like seven and under. That was Mary Frances down to Alec. And then there was a little space with Sadie and then a bigger space with Maria. But there was, you know, in those in those years, it was what you will imagine, a bunch of little kids running around, chaos, you know, just serving the basic needs. And now, you know, fast forward, um, we've got the, the, the range that we have, but so many of our kids are teenagers now, Julia, Claire, Michael, and Mary Frances, and they are very into a wide range of activities from school events to homeschooling 
things that we're still involved in to sports, gymnastics and hockey and soccer and and extracurricular, you know, events. So our homes and a lot of homework. We we started homeschooling and then we've branched into different versions of homeschooling, including um, a couple of our kids go part time now to a private Catholic school. And so there's a lot of homework and things. It's it's Michael's last year in school, so he's very busy with that. So it's less about getting up in the morning and being all together all day and planning our day how in whatever way we want. Um, and doing the farming together and those things. Now it's, okay, you got to go off to school and you don't get back till such and such a time and there's exams to study for and this, that, and the other thing. And now you got to go to hockey practice. And so it's it's switched, definitely. I mean, right now we're, we're just as busy, but just in different ways. It's not all centered at home. It's kind of outreach all the time, driving kids here and there and and all that sort of thing. So it's still great, though. Like, I mean... We still play music every day. We the house gets very noisy at times. There's other times it's oddly quiet. And I don't know, Danelle, if you want to add anything to that quick overview. I I, I don't think I've been there for those quiet moments. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're farmers and we're musicians, and farm life is get up and go till dark. Music or anything you want to excel at these days is almost the same. I know people are quite familiar with sports, and if you're talented and you want to make it in sports, well, then you dedicate yourself to that. Same in school. If you want to, apparently, if you want to be a great scholar and, and great in the academics, well, you apply yourself. So it's hard, to, you know, we, we want our children to, to we, we, we have hopes and dreams for them, uh, not that we're pushing... Uh, uh, that on them, but we want to, you know, like probably all, all other parents, you want to expose them to many different uh, things in life, opportunities. Uh, but when they all start colliding, right? It's 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 hard to to know what to do. So we very much believe in work and farm work, and but then there's school and then there's sports. What's well, a Saturday? How can we not be out? Like I grew up working on Saturdays uh, on on the farm. Well. I, it's, there's work to be done. Well, I have a hockey game two hours away. It's and it's this balancing, you know. Uh, yep. It's, coin, it's, 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 I like it, the word collide, though. Collide. It's so true. <laughs> but it's, um, for example, on our trip to Notre Dame, we not all the children are with us. We would want them to be here, and, it, and the music is most important to us. But you have to recognize that we don't want to look back on our on our lives and, and say the kids missed out on a, a number of things because of music. Right. You know, yeah, um, that can little, happen. And, and that can happen. Well, that can happen in years later when they've chosen this. But right now, it's just not something they, they've, well, for a couple of them it might be, but not everyone has decided, I want to dedicate myself to music. There's, we're still in the searching phase. Yeah. And with seven, I mean, again, that means nine different wills all operating together hmm. or colliding. Right. Basically. And so it, it, it's uh, to, to pick up again on that, when everyone is young, you know, um, we're all in the same boat. Hop in, we're going. When we come back, we come back, and everyone goes to bed. You know, as opposed to now there's there's different things happening. So um, I guess we maybe spoke on that, but I, but, but I remember as a, as, a, as a kid in my family, touring with Leahy, yeah. we were all single, and the answer was yes. We could, one voice, we could all pack up and leave, didn't matter if we were gone for 300 days. We were all in the same boat. That must have been more when you when you say you're single, you're obviously in your 20s or late teens. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. But then one of my sisters got married, and then there was a baby, and it's like, whoa, how do, what, now what? What? Mm-hmm. Anyway, and, and so we, we've had that, that similar <clears throat> mm-hmm. experience. You mm-hmm. and I were single, then we were married without mm-hmm. children, mm-hmm. and then a baby comes, mm-hmm. and it's like, whoa. Now what? Now shift. <laughs> shifting. You're constantly shifting. Yeah. And everybody will ask, oh, how do you balance it? How do you... Well, we're, we're constantly in learning phase. We're in a learning mode. Okay, now we have, you know, uh, you know, child who can drive. Okay, so we're switching again. Now, okay, now the one that was 12 is now, you know, 14 with new set of interests. Mm-hmm. Or like this is our, you know, first time parenting you know, teenagers, this is their first time parenting adults, you know, because Mary Frances is an adult now. She's 18. 
So, you know, it's, it's like every phase is new. Yeah. We, people often ask us like, or marvel at how we balance everything. Oh my God, I don't know how you do it. And the answer is, neither do we. Like, <laughs> what else do you do? You get up and you try. Yeah, you get up and, and you, you hope try. you're you hope you're leading in the in the right in the right direction, and mm-hmm. and you pray and trust. And when you're doing interviews, you be calm and confident and yeah. pretend you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that you have achieved mastery in music, uh, however, gives you a certain confidence. I'm going to imagine when you're on stage, you are in command. I think so. There's yeah. no think about it, Danelle. You yeah. know so. I know so. When you're in shape, and you're right, you've built up a, built up a confidence over years. I mean, you can't do this uh, this long. If you're still at it, you're being successful. And that confidence comes with that. And that's, that's something to always, um, I can always lean on. The stage is, is always... Oh, a safe place for me, or uh, no matter what else is going on, I know what, what when I get out on the stage, I've I got that under control. Yeah. So it's it's a some it's often a nice place to be. <laughs> sure I'm good out here. I have it figured out. Uh, athletes often talk about being in the state of flow. You know, it's like you see everything. You know, you know. Uh, I can only imagine what this is like to be honest, because I've mm-hmm. never been an athlete. But I'm going to imagine that in the music that those moments happen where you're just you're just in the zone joyful in the zone yeah yeah for sure they do I mean it's interesting like I I really like what you mentioned about the confidence because you don't realize that you have that expertise and confidence there you don't analyze it you just through the years you develop it and so yeah you do get in the zone you get in a place where you know everything you've been through enough situations you pretty much there's nothing you can get that can get fired at you that you can't figure out how to navigate on the fly Mm -hmm. and it's a good feeling you feel like I can handle things and I suppose that can even leak over into life you know that there's somehow that can help you navigate through life because you can trust in the fact that you, you know, you've become uh, very capable in certain areas. And, but when you're on stage, I mean, yeah, this in the zone kind of term, there are times when everything clicks and, you know, your place, the state of your mind is very uh, focused on, how everything is connecting at that moment. And that's when you enter into a place of ecstasy, I suppose, you know, mm-hmm. there's um like, I don't know the term of that or the definition specifically, but that place where like there's such harmony and the band is just right on, you can hear them well, they're, they're right in the zone with you. And, you know, you're very connected to all the players around you, but you're also the connection to the audience. Like, you're the center point of all that. And people will say to me sometimes, they'll say, oh, the audience won't know if you make a mistake or they won't know if you're not having a great night. And I think they do. And I don't, I think that they don't know that they do, but there's this extra little bit, I'll call it magic, of magic that happens. And when things are right on stage, I think you transmit something you don't realize you're transmitting. And I think they receive it, even though they don't know they're receiving it. But it's just a little extra something special and um there's a very good feeling that comes following that you're almost on a high you know well you are on a high Mm -hmm. and you feel like you did something right with your life and you feel like you've uh given to people i think that a lot of people i certainly younger in the younger years of performing um well, first of all, I think a lot of people have the perception that, oh, you're on stage prancing around. You must be one of those types that you just have that personality type where you want to show off or whatever. Well, I was never a show off and you were never like you just get into a, an instrument, you know, and you're nine years old and you just play and play. And eventually you land on the stage. You didn't necessarily aspire for becoming a famous person or a star, or whatever the term is. No, you just kind of got into the music first. And eventually you find yourself on stage and then you find yourself on stage 
you know, progressing and developing into your own artist. And, you know, so then the decades pass and you realize you're, you're an, inter an entertainer. But really, I look at entertaining as very much serving the needs of people. Like we get on stage and it's so not about me in so many ways. It's so about delivering, being a conduit of, of music to people who paid money to see you play. Like they want to be entertained. They're open to what you have to give and you have to give that to them. And you're not up there just to play whatever you want and be inward. You're out there completely giving whether you're sick, whether you don't not in the mood to play that tune again for the millionth time or whether you're this or that. It doesn't matter if, if you, the mindset has to be, I'm here to serve the audience. I remember being at a, playing a concert in Toronto at Massey Hall. Massey Hall would be one of our Toronto's main venues. It's it's it's, it's classic place and uh, full house. And I'm up there playing like a really big number for me. F fiddle piano, all the band is off the stage. The moment is on, and it's a very difficult piece. And I am so into it, and I'm I'm giving it, and it's going great, <laughs> you know. And I'm giving it, and I I was so into it, I broke a string. And when I broke the string, I yelled, ah, and I was embarrassed. I went like, oh my gosh. And I got a standing ovation <laughs> oh because everybody felt the moment and they realized what happened and the honesty in my delivery, my scream was out of, oh my God, I can't believe that just happened to me. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, so I was totally lost in it there. Yeah. Right. The passion and... And giving literally everything. Everything. But they felt it too. They felt it. That's that little thing I'm talking about. Yeah. Like you could have been detached mm -hmm. and you could, the same thing could have happened, but there's not, the, the audience, even though they can't articulate it or wouldn't necessarily see, see or know, there's something different that's given off when you're really connected to everything. Mm -hmm. You can even see it in... I mean, I, I could see it in still photos of, uh, you know, taken of performers mm -hmm. in that moment, mm -hmm. you know, even in a still photo, there's something captured that you can see that there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a verve and a, a joy and also a, a moment of perfection, mm -hmm. you know, um, I've seen photos of you on stage, you know, it, while perusing your website. So good, good choices on uh, photos, but, but you can see those moments, uh, and, and you're right. As an audience member here, I'm standing back and, mm -hmm. you know, in my chair or or standing probably, mm -hmm. um, and the the sway, just everything, everything about it becomes becomes a, mm -hmm. a motion together. Mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. uh, trying to get at what you're saying. This moment of magic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the music you record is dance music. Um, and so here I am talking about sitting in my chair or maybe standing. What's it like to perform just music that makes you want to move in uh, venues where that's not a practical option? Well, there are times when we do feel that detachment or that restriction, I should say. I mean, it is dance music. And over the years, I think you'd be the same, Danelle, We've gotten used to being in a soft cedar venue, but it's a different vibe. And sometimes it is restrictive. Like you, there's not that intensity of energy as when you're on a stage, you're outdoors, it's a festival. The music is so loud and everybody's out there and they're sweating and they're hot and they're, you know, just in the frame of mind that is like they're open to everything you have to give them and, it's just, and they're just moving because they can, they're, you're, you know, there's no restrictions and that there's, I mean, you definitely feel that, okay, the music is being responded to the way that it's meant to be responded to. Whereas in the theater, yeah, everybody's got to sit down. God help the person who stands up. It's like, Shh, sit down, be quiet, you know, no, don't disrupt my viewing pleasure. So yeah, there is that. Um, but like I said, we've gotten used to that over the years and you tailor your performance to that environment I, th I think it, it, it it's good to note that both of our musical uh, origins and, and styles came from playing for dances yeah so in Cape Breton they played the fiddler played for square dancing um, uh, and step dancing 
and in in where I came from in 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 Ontario, and my parents they played for dances, and the idea was. And when I would play for them, you had to get people dancing and keep people dancing. So you're searching for, I can remember being, uh, you know, starting the evening off and no one wants to dance. And you're trying to get a, a style or a speed or a, or a, a waltz or a, a polka or <clears throat> something that they'll dance to. And once you get them, now you got to keep them. Right. And so we've both come from that. Natalie's playing, you know, the, the true Cape Breton uh, <clears throat> aficionados, they want the Cape Breton music, the timing, to be perfect. Not too fast, not too slow, and consistent. And if you deviate from that, that's a no-no. Oh, there. Right? <clears throat> Where I came from, it you wasn't It wasn't. You like, won't draw the crowd. That's what you it won't is. Draw you'll, the know crowd. It. you'll know it because over time you won't draw it. People will come here you play. Because your, your timing's not right. Yeah. But now we're out in the world and we're hearing... We're hearing, you know, and p- performing with and, and collaborating with many different artists and styles, and you're entertaining a crowd that's maybe not a dance crowd. So all these things come into play, and you just—I don't know how much con- consciousness we, we conscious thought we put into it, but you are trying to um, entertain, get a rise out of the crowd, play to them. Um, so we're playing tonight uh, in Notre Dame. So I don't know we. We uh, we'll, in a, in a soft seated theater in a soft seated you know. theater. Yeah, but but um, I know it's 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 still good. It's it's a great place to hear music. Soft seat. It's it's uh, it's finding the right. Here we go again. Balance of speed and timing and beautifulness. Is that a word? Beautifulness. <laughs> yeah, beautifulness. Beauty. Or you could say beauty. <laughs> oh, beauty, beautifulness. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's a new word. It's got the word fullness in it, which fullness. is what you want. You're there. seeking the plenitude of beauty. Thanks for saving me. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, well, you know, you mentioned there you've collaborated, and uh, I mean, you've played at World Youth Day in Toronto, at fundraisers for pro life family uh, support clinics. You prayed at Uh, played at prayer breakfasts and at many other stages where your Catholic faith and commitments are are also on display. How does your faith uh, influence and interact with your artistry? We're both looking at each other. Who wants to go first? Go ahead, Nat. Mm, How does it interact with the artistry? It's definitely entangled within, for sure. It's, It's all... And I say tangled because it's all knotted up together. You, you can't, you can't pick through and separate. It's it's very much a part of it because we attribute our faith to the component that has led to everything that we are, and even our marriage and everything. It, it's it's all rooted in our faith. Our beliefs have directed our path in life our openness to being led and and I think specifically too like in Cape Breton I definitely I mean as a kid you don't analyze things you don't see things as much but now after having gone through I'm 51 now after having a, a, life, a career for a 40 year span I can look back and say oh, I think the music was holy I think the music of Cape Breton there's a holiness to it because it elevates and I think you see more of the beauty of God's creation through the interactions of people and the culture, the traditions, like the goodness that comes from them, that, that's bred from that, the camaraderie and the unity. And when I say elevates, I, I do believe that people get high on music and they become more open maybe to good things or a a vision of good things or receivers and givers of good things when they're high on music. I think it just elevates the mind and the heart and the soul. And not all music does that. I mean, there's a lot of music out there that's really, I'll call it bad. And I don't mean bad, poorly played. I mean, like, can lead to a lot of evil. And so I don't know how to define what music elevates and what doesn't. But when Danelle and I got married, or my bishop friend, who was a fiddler, he since passed away, but his name was Bishop Faber MacDonald, and he did our homily. And he ended our homily with, there are two things in this world that are eternal, music and love. 
and he then he said I think he said may the love and music of Cana he was talking about the wedding feast of Cana live on and on and on in our lives and I think of that quote almost every day over the past 21 years because I when he first said it I, I was like oh really music's eternal like what does that mean and and love is eternal like what does that mean and so just through just different experiences in life um those thoughts come into my mind I'm like is this what this means is and I'm still analyzing what it means and a person can take so many different definitions of that with different experiences there's a million ways to kind of look at it and think about it but I, I still am, am always analyzing it yeah a few few thoughts <laughs> the, the 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 church and our faith is most important to us that's that's our number one and when I look back, my, my Irish ancestors came from County Cork, 1825, to Ontario, Canada. Um, and they brought with them their mind, their hearts, their instruments, uh, and not much else. And the music um, thrived in the home, in the church, in the church hall, and when we go back to Cape Breton, although I'm not from Cape Breton, and my mom is from there, um, a lot of the priests, a lot of the functions um, happened in the parishes. Glencoe Mills, uh, Glendale, all the uh, Broadcove concert, all these, the music thrived in the priests and the people of the church. Uh, and in my, my, my uncle, Father Leo Leahy, um, was a big lover of music and and that so you're playing music in such a great environment with great people. My my dad's name was Frank Leahy. My dad <laughs> passed away and dad uh, um, I'm getting way off topic here for a second. It's okay. Uh, when I was a little boy, of course, I heard of Notre Dame and I, what was that? And it's a school. And then I heard Frank Leahy was the coach, and I got a book. It was Frank Leahy and the Fighting Irish. Yep. Wow. And I said, my dad's name is Frank Leahy. <laughs> and when I was a little boy, I'd say, my dad is Frank Leahy, oh, too. And people cute. wouldn't in Canada know much. Did you guys take a photo in front of the statue at Notre Dame Stadium of Frank Leahy? No. No, yeah, I we didn't. Will, we will do that before we get you back to the hotel. Today. Oh, I need that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll yeah. Do, we'll do anyway, I'm sorry. I sorry, no, it's okay. There. It's okay. <laughs> That's me. I'm scattered. You know, you asked about our faith and the music. We grew up with music alongside of our faith. It was It was... I think you said it well, Natalie. It's in everything we do. It is what we aim for and strive for, and that's that's our focus. And and um, it is literally the the backbone of all we are and all we do, and and we play music as well. Yeah, and I think it's an unintentional intersection of the two. Like somebody said, you pray before you go on stage. I'm like, very rarely. You know, I don't say a prayer before I go on stage. I very rarely, now you do, but I never did. But I think that my faith is just always with me. And so it's like, for example, if you forget to say your morning prayers, does that mean you're going to get run over by a, you know, a car that day because you didn't ask your guardian angel to, to watch out for you, right? Well, probably not. Like you're united much more deeply than just what your humanity brings, gives you know, so I always say, no, God is with me in my music 100%, even though I haven't made the uh, acknowledgement verbally, you know, it's much deeper than my intellect or my or my memory. <laughs> what did your grandma say about Scotch music? Oh, my grandmother. Oh, my gosh, it's such a great quote. And I don't know if people get it the way I think of it, but... My grandmother was such a lover of the music, and she was a very faithful, devout Catholic, but she used to say, I, I don't think there's anything as close to heaven on God's green earth as Scotch music. I think God must be playing it up there all the time. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, the Scotch music, of course, being the fiddle music of yeah. Cape Breton. Yeah. That's glorious. Now... Your albums reveal a wide variety of influences, from the traditional music of Cape Breton to uh, there's flamenco, there's alt country, there's downright contemporary R&B. Uh, you've recorded with Yo-Yo Ma, 
Alison Krauss. That track, by the way, is very haunting. I really loved it. Uh, Bella Fleck, you've recorded with a whole bunch of others. So who might yet be on your musical collaboration bucket list? Great wow. question. Because we've been talking about doing collaborations and I was like, who would we get? You know, we were actually talking about other married couples who play music, mm. you know. And we played um, oh, a month or so ago with Bela Fleck and, and, and Abigail. Uh, we did a kind of a, a thing, just the two couples. It was really cool. So that got us to thinking about yeah. just collaboration. So I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, we've. I have a cousin, Jack White. He's a distant cousin, of course, from the White Stripes. Mm -hmm. And um, I always thought, well, I have to do something with him at some point. His mother came to one of my shows and showed me the family tree, mm -hmm. the, re the relation. It's. I mean, it's a distant relation, but um, I've had him on the back of my mind. And I don't know why. You'll, you'll be surprised by this, but... Oftentimes, I think to myself, I'd love to do something with Brian Adams. Canada's yeah. other favorite. Yeah. Really? <laughs> I would. I'd love to hear him sing like a folk song. Yeah. Well, yeah. anything I do, I do for you is almost a folk song. That's Just right. Just it down. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Says the totally non-musical guy over here. Yeah. But I can hear it in my head all right, night. Right, right. That's fantastic. Yeah. Huh. Do you have anybody that you want to play with? Just you, Natalie. Just okay, you. Okay, good answer. We'll take that. <laughs> well, you did record the album one together. Yeah. What was that experience like? Well, it first of all, playing together it was quite an experience to get used to. So Natalie and I have two distinctly different styles. Uh, Natalie grew up with Cape Breton and I grew up in... Uh, my style, I think, is more defined by not being around other fiddle players. Where I grew up, I grew up in hockey country. And although there were little pockets of fiddling, I didn't hear it. I played the fiddle and... Whatever I heard on the radio, whatever I made up, that's what I played. And so I would hear a classical fiddle, violinist or fiddler, and I'd say, wow, that's cool, and I'd learn that. And I'd hear a Cape Breton thing, and I'd learn that. So, that's, so that in, in, our, in our world, there are standard tunes. You know, in, in the, in the non-fiddle world, what would the standard song be? May the circle be unbroken, mm -hmm. or I don't know. And everyone could sing a version of whatever. When Natalie and I would sit down and play these standard tunes, it was not good. Because I was so different to Natalie, and we 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 were so excited. We get married, Rob. We're gonna we're gonna play, and we and we heard ourselves uh, recorded one night at a party, and we listened back, and it was like, ugh. I was covering up her nuances, and she was stepping on my, you know. And then so when we started playing together, we actually backed off. I didn't want to upstage her or or dominate, and she didn't want to. And my brother said, you know, I came to see you guys tonight, and uh, I didn't see Natalie, or I didn't see you. I didn't see either of you up there. Yeah. I was like, really? And you know, we were being respectful of the other. <laughs> yeah. And so just with confidence again, I'm, I'm so confident in Natalie, and I, I think she's confident in what I do. We just go up and do it now. And we, and if we write music together, it, 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 it works, or if we learn a tune together. But we've, we, we play. So playing together, uh, I think it's more thought out, uh, what we do now. Yeah, and you learn to listen to the other person more. We're like, so used to being the front person where mm -hmm. everyone follows us. I go out there when I do my thing and everyone, you know, it's I'm doing my thing and Natalie the same way, but now we have to listen. That's a good point. Yeah, because when it was just us, you're just focusing on playing really well. But now for us to play, for us to sound like we're playing really well, there's two of us, so we have to listen to each other so that we're locked in together. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I... I adjust what I do a little bit when I'm playing with Danelle, and you adjust what you do as well to make it sound good together. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about that writing process. You know, Danelle, you just kind of mentioned it when you're writing things together, you're in a new spot because you're both approaching something new together. So it's not, mm -hmm. you know, it's easier to incorporate perhaps one another's mm -hmm. gifts and talents. So tell me about that process. Your music is so steeped in tradition, which means you have it in your, you have that muscle memory. How how do you not fall just back into the same old licks that you always have done? Uh, what's that process like of writing new, semi you know traditional stuff? That's a great question. I I think I think that we're around so many other musicians. Our band, our our guitar player is from Cuba, and he comes from from that culture, and our 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 drummers from Ireland, and uh, and our daughter Mary Frances, who now is on keyboards with us. Man, she's 
she's into Latin music and classical and, and all, all the things we do. So we're around this stuff. And uh, most of the times we write, we don't sit down to write. We're, we're playing and something comes to us. And all Jam that. session kind of stuff? Not even that. I'd say if I was playing by myself, I'd be practicing and messing around and some little lick would happen. And I'd say, that's kind of cool. And then I'd write a part and Natalie may, may hear it and say, oh, I, that's, that's, I like that. And a second part is written. I mean, we have all the different... It's, it's, I've, I've written tunes in five minutes. You've written tunes in five minutes. We've taken years five to write years. pieces. And then the Natalie finishes one of my pieces or... or a guitar player, Tim Eady, we wrote a piece there a while back where Tim uh, just started chording to one one thing that we were doing and it, it totally went in another direction and a tune was born. Maybe you can... I can remember all sorts of different versions, like you're saying. This tune called The Chase was one where we had... It's like one of my favorite things we've ever done together. And we end up, it's, it can't, it, we, we, we keep saying, well, we've done it for so long, let's get it out of the show and put something else in. But it's hard to take it out because it covers so much of the bases. But that tune is so funny because we wrote, uh, I think it's got one, two, three, four, five, six parts to it. But we probably wrote eight or nine parts and they were really good, all the parts. And... The struggle with that is, like, how do we put these parts together? Like, normally with fiddle tunes, there's two sections, an A part and a B part. Sometimes you get a C and a D, but, like, never more than that. It's usually, like, 90% of everything we play, it's a two-part tune. So we had, like, nine parts. And we ended up, in the end, saying, you know what? We've got to get rid of some of these parts. And we're like, oh my gosh, I can't let this go. It's such a great melody. It's, it's so great. It's so suiting for the tune. But it's like making, you know, a great pasta sauce. Like, you can't just put every great seasoning in there. You're going to have competing flavors, and you'll have a final product that doesn't have any particular distinction. And so if you go to a nice restaurant, you'll see sometimes, you know, it's the brown butter with the sage and the parmesan, and that's it. And so I was like, no, I think this tune is going to be better if we have less in it. And so we did, we got rid of three great parts, but the ultimate, the end result is Chase, which I love. I think it's perfection. I don't say that about any of our, much of our music. Like, I don't think I've said it about anything, but just the flow of it and everything, I think it's the way it's supposed to be. And it took us five years to come to that. I mean, we stepped away from, from it for a year, you know, or so, and then you come back with fresh ears, but it was worth it because it came, came up with the best end result. Now, those three parts that you rejected, three yep. or however many, they're still sitting in an idea bin somewhere. Yep. They are. In fact, I went looking for them <laughs> not too long ago, and I don't have them on my phone. I'm hoping that they're in the computer, saved from a computer or somewhere. But I also know, too, that, I mean, they're going to have the same flavoring as the Chase, so they may just want to just stay in the vault Never to be born to life, but I don't know who knows. Somewhere is the basement tapes. Yeah, of, that's right. Uh, <laughs> that's like a good, master and, good CD. Oh, and title. <laughs> well, that leads into my kind of my final question that I always like is: so, what's next? What What are you working on? Do you have your new album in progress? I mean, I know you're on the road all this month. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a busy month, and but what 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 comes next? Well, I'm working on a book that uh, I started the concept for five years ago, and it's called I Have a Love Story, and it's hopefully going to be out this fall, and it's basically the motivation of it is just to kind of recount moments in my life where I believe just good old-fashioned love was at the core of it, and what is good old-fashioned love? It's just like, it's sacrifice, really. It's like the action of love where you extend yourself for the sake of someone else. And I have been a recipient of that through my parents and my upbringing in Cape Breton. And I saw, I saw love more than ever heard about it. I saw it. And that's the greatest teacher. It's the greatest, they say, that's the greatest way to learn something is to witness it. And I certainly witnessed it. And I find that the world has become a place where there's a lot of talk, a lot of talk, but where's the depth? Where's the action of love? And so, yeah, it's recounting different 
moments of my life where I believe that sacrificial love has had a huge place in that moment. And it's to elevate as well marriage and having children and dedications to things. The music is, is talked about in there as well. And that, like I said, will hopefully be coming out this fall, if not, if not in the fall, spring 25. But as far as other projects... Um, We've, we um, made a conscious effort not to travel as much over the last number of years because of our little ones. They come with us, and, and so we, we've not been to Europe very much. Uh, last year we went uh, back to Ireland and had a glorious time. And so I would expect we'll be heading across the pond a lot more now. The kids are of, of an age that um, they can travel really well, and, and it's so exciting with them. We, we have a new record we just put out uh, last year. We're thinking of some more collaborations and always have records in our minds. Our little ones are now, um, especially Mary Frances and Michael, uh, 18 years and 16-year-old, they're really um, liking music, and they're starting to play a little bit on their own. So, we're uh, big fans and supporters of them, and it's 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 exciting because I, I think that the great times, the hard times, but the great times in my career in my life when, you know, I was starting out, and everything's so exciting, and you're, you know, trying to get heard and noticed, and playing in small little venues, and all the little victories along the way. You know, and so I'm starting to see that with the kids and I kind of get to relive it. You know, I get to go and 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 see it and and be part of that kind of in the background. And Mary Frances will launch herself this year, too. That's a project on the go. She has a record coming out and we have some copies with us, but it's officially it'll officially be out in April. So just to witness that and be a part of her developing herself. That's very exciting to me because she's so passionate about it and she invests so much time practicing and dedication and she's very talented. So it's all original music and so it's fun, like you said, Janelle, it's like reliving certain things mm. and just I'm just excited for her. How awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, Natalie and Danelle, thank you so much for coming to Notre Dame. Thank you for sharing your music with us and thanks for sharing a great conversation. Good. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you to Natalie and Donnell. In the show notes, you will find a link to their webpage, as well as a selection of their albums and interviews. Subscribe to Ethics and Culture Cast so that you can always get the latest episodes by visiting ethicscenter.nd.edu slash podcast. We would love your feedback. Please review the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts, and email your suggestions to cecpodcast at nd.edu. Our theme music is I Don't Know by Grapes, licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution License. We'll see you next time on Ethics and Culture Cast. Until then, make good decisions. <laughs>